Uh, it is my pleasure as a uh, Region 2 uh, business development training, as part of the Region 2 uh, business development uh, training team. Uh, we are very happy to introduce Holly Caputo, Frank Townsend, and Matt Mastronardo, and they will be taking you through managing your M MAS contract. Matt, I believe you're first up. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Matt Mastronardo, and uh, as well, we have uh, Holly and Frank here presenting along with me. This is the Managing Your MAS contract training. And uh, we're assuming that all attendees have already been awarded a GSA contract and that most of you are new contract holders at the very beginning of the post-award process. Um, that said, some of you may be existing contract holders and who are looking for a refresher and you are most welcome as well. Today, uh, myself, Holly and Frank, we're gonna cover important post-award basics and provide resources to help you manage your GSA contract so that you can be successful in the federal market. So here's what our agenda looks like today. I'll be kicking it off with MAS basics. Uh, Frank is going to talk about contract requirements and get into some key compliance items that you wanna be aware of. And Holly will close with keeping your contract current and that's gonna be about post-award modifications. Afterwards, we're going to have time for questions and answers. We'll try to answer as many as we can. All right. So first, just to, to kind of baseline a bit, just do some uh, basics. Um, the multiple word schedule program, let's just define that a little bit. Um, the GSA schedules program, it's the largest and it's the most successful buying program in the federal government. So about 40 billion flows through it annually, and that's around 21% of the federal procurement spend. So that 21% slice, um, that large, uh, is primarily, primarily due to the fact that it delivers much faster acquisition process and a streamlined acquisition process. So GSA establishes these contracts as long-term government-wide contracts with commercial companies to provide access to millions of commercial products and commercial services and solutions at best pricing or volume discount pricing. So here are some benefits of, of MAS. Um, the program is designed to help federal buyers comply with all the rules and regulations to buy products and services the right way to save them time and to save them money. So for a lot of the same reasons that it's a benefit for customers, it's also a benefit for contractors as well. Um, so some of the benefits are um, really reducing the cost of federal government business opportunities because GSA has done a lot of the upfront work for both you and, and the customer. And that's not to say all the work that you've done and time that, and effort that you've put in to get your um, offer in place so we could review the contract or review the offer and, and get it awarded. So some of these things um, that, that you've provided for us and that we've reviewed on our end is verifying past performance experience, analyzing your financial stability and negotiating your pricing and terms and conditions. So GSA has pre-qualified your vendor status with an MAS contract award. And a lot of those things I mentioned would otherwise have had to be done each open market procurement. So that's where it eliminates a lot of redundancy. So because it shortens the process and timeline for government customers, that means that the task and, order and delivery orders are going to get issued to you more quickly. So that's a little bit of reasons why being an MAS contract holder can enhance your position in the government market by helping you differentiate yourself and give you a competitive advantage. But that being said, there are thousands of contracts in place. We are onboarding new vendors every day. So the competition is still fierce. That's why to tie this back to, to what we're talking about today, um, it's really going to be, you're going to need to be extremely knowledgeable about what it takes to manage your MAS contract while continually looking for, for government business opportunities. So our aim here is to provide you with information and tools that you need to navigate your road to success. What I wanna do here is just do a little bit of myth busting. Um, a common myth is that uh, with a GSA schedule contract, um, federal agencies are going to be knocking down your, your door to buy what you're selling. Um, the, the reality really is, is that the GSA MAS, a GSA MAS contract, it does provide you with a competitive edge in an already highly competitive market, but that's, that's really all. In many ways, you are going to be selling to the government just like selling to government, uh, just like selling to customers in the commercial marketplace. So um, 
the sales are really not guaranteed, right? That's, that's a key thing that uh, I just want to you know establish. Sales are not guaranteed. Um, you should even still have a risk of losing your contract. And uh, Frank will be uh, talking about this later in, in this training, but there is a minimum annual sales requirement of $25,000 for the first two years and every year afterwards. So marketing is required and it's really not that much different than selling to commercial customers. Um, one, one component though is that um, there is a great value in schedules for both, for both you and the customer. Um, and GSA is dedicated to helping you because your success is really our success. Um, our, the way this, this works at GSA is our agency is not funded by appropriations. We're not funded by tax dollars. So we're really funded by your schedule contract sales. So when you're successful, we're successful. So let's talk a little bit about what success looks like for different stakeholders in the MAS program. We have the ordering activity or the, the customer agency that's gonna actually be buying off of the contract, uh, the contractors like yourselves and GSA. So for customers, success really occurs when they're getting quality products and services that, that are delivered on time that are either at or under budget and that their needs are satisfied. For contractors, success is really about generating sales, making a fair profit and growing as a business. And for GSA, success occurs when both those both those things are met, but also when the when our contractors are in really full compliance with their terms and conditions. Because um, remember what I said uh, earlier, it's really the part of this program or what the MES program is really established, so customers can buy products and services the right way. Key point here that I, I want to just pause uh, is. Prior to submitting your offer at GSA, you should have developed some kind of compliance plan to make sure that you had the necessary systems and processes in place to monitor the many contract terms and conditions in your contract. So if you didn't do that already, this is what you need to start thinking about and really start constructing a plan today. And so hopefully this webinar, what we're gonna be getting into about modifications and key compliance issues is gonna help assist you with that. So again, we're here to help you become a successful contractor. And um, on my next and last slide, uh, for me, I'm gonna be introducing you to the people who are gonna help you make that a reality. So MAS, for, for your um, MAS contract, you have four really points of contact, main points of contact. You're likely familiar uh, with your procurement contracting officer or your PC, PCO. They were the contact that awarded your MAS contract, and they're the, they're the ones that are responsible for executing your subsequent modification requests. So Holly's going to be getting into this later, but the modification requests include anything like your updating your MAS contract price list, uh, doing administrative updates, like updating point co points of contact, uh, as well as legal changes um, from, say, if you had a merger or acquisition, um, then you would need to submit a name change or an ovation. So it's your PCO that helps you with, uh, with getting those things done. And if you're not sure who your PCO is, you can find this information by looking up your contract in GSAE library, and you'll find that information in the upper right-hand side uh, under the section that says government point of contact. So that's your PCO. Next, we have the administrative contracting officer or the ACO. Now they were assigned after your contract was awarded and your ACO is responsible for managing the remittance of the industrial funding fee or that 0 0.75 IFF that you may be familiar with that was tacked on in the, uh, the right column in uh, your price proposal template. Um, they monitor timely reporting of your MAS sales and they administer mass modifications. And that, that's a, a GSA initiated modification that changes the language in the solicitation. So it updates uh, language in, the, in clauses and provisions or adds clauses and provisions or removes them. Uh, and we ask contractors to always be acting on the most recent version of the solicitation in order to stay compliant. Um, the ACO also uh, tracks subcontracting plans or sub K plans. So that's only applicable if you are a large business. Next, we have the IOA or Industrial Operations Analyst. They are responsible for reviewing your contract compliance through contractor assistance visits uh, or, or CAVs, uh, and they're performed at, at the company site or virtually. 
So those findings from the contractor or assistant visits, they are then provided to the PCO and ACO uh, to review and take any action if there's any uh, compliance issues that, that need to be taken care of. Also, the IOA is a great resource who can help you, uh, who can provide guidance to you about compliance issues, as well as direct you to business development resources. Lastly, we have business development specialists like myself. We provide uh, general vendor support and uh, business development resources, as well as um, manage customer and industry outreach and events such, such as this. So that's a little bit about the points of contact, what success looks like in the MAS program. We went over a little bit of myth busting and some basics of the program. And next we're going to get really to the meat of things with Frank Townsend, who's up next, and he's gonna be discussing some key compliance issues that you need to be aware of. So Frank, you can uh, take it away. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Matt. Yes, as Matt was uh, referring to, I'll be covering uh, the uh, contractor assessment, um, starting off with participation. Um, so, so starting off here and uh, determining who should be present during the contractor assessment is dependent upon your business model and who is responsible for the various uh, requirements of your contract. So optimally, uh, try to have the designated contract administrator present as well as other personnel um, who are responsible for the identification, the creation, and the submission of your sales data is also beneficial to have any folks in sales and marketing personnel available and someone who has knowledge of your product's country of origin. And you'll be asked to participate in a, a contractor assessment between uh, the 24th and 36th month of your contract term and near the end of each uh, term of your contract. And although this is the norm, there are some circumstances that may require additional assessments. So this is, this is a, how a typical uh, contractor assessment will be conducted. Uh, your IOA will contact you to schedule a date and time to conduct the CA. The IOA will also send a confirmation email requesting documentation needed to support the CA. So it's important that your sales data, if requested, um, will be requested, it is provided well in advance to give the IOA time to review the documentation prior to the CA meeting as well as it'll give you guys time to prepare any orders um, that you need to provide to support the CA. The closeout meeting will be an opportunity to review the assessment results in detail and then address any action items. And then your IOA will complete the contractor assessment report or CAR and then finalize this CAR and will be emailed to you and your, uh, your administrative representative. So preparing for the CA. So a good place to start in preparing for the CA is it's important that you have access to your MSA contract, including any modifications, current and past price list. Other applicable documentation may include products country of origin or you know, sourcing documentation, the contractor team and agreements as applicable, um, any order documentation, quotes, purchase orders, invoices, or BPAs. If you have any questions regarding what you need to provide, you should contact your industrial operation analyst and they'll be more than happy to assist you in the process. Now we're going to go into the assessment topics in a little more detail. Um, each one of these um, is, is, is listed here, you know, in order as we're going to go through them in the presentation and we're discussing, um, you know, first starting off with the contract sales criteria. Uh, and then next we'll talk about the sales tracking, reporting, and order level material. We'll touch on that. Industrial funding fee, your GSA contract price list, scope of contract, trade agreement act, basis of award, labor qualifications, and subcontracting uh, for, sub for large businesses. And then lastly, we'll talk about the contract administration. Okay, so starting off with the contract sales criteria, your, so your MAS contract require, requires that you generate 25,000 in sales for the first 24 months of your contract term and 25,000 in sales every year after. And like Matt was, was alluding to earlier, the government may cancel your contract if you're not meeting the minimum sales reporting clause. So this is you know, really important to, to know this uh, requirement. Is in, for, in the unfortunate event that you were to enter any, into a bankruptcy proceeding, you may have certain contractual responsibilities, most important of which is to notify your procurement contracting officer and administrative contracting um, officer, or administrative contractor officer in writing within five business days of the initiation of the proceeding. 
uh, reference the bankruptcy clause in your contract for more information, including what elements need to be included in your written notification. And this can be found in uh, FAR Clause 52.242-13 on acquisition gov. So proper recognition and reporting of your scheduled sales is critical to your performance and an accurate sales system will make both of these uh, tasks easier. So there is no correct way uh, to, to, uh, to have your sales tracking system set up. However, it should you should have a system in place to identify, track, and report your sales accurately and completely. It's also important that your sales uh, data can be quickly retrieved by your staff. Um, so for example, if we're asking you to provide data uh, to support the contractor assessment or your, your ACO may contact you and request sales data, having that uh, data available is very important and being able to turn that around uh, quickly. Um, and then it's also important to maintain a consistent accounting method of your sales reporting based on the established uh, commercial accounting practice your commercial accounting practice. The acceptable points of a sale might be included are a receipt of order, shipment, or delivery, or issuance of an invoice. And those first three, those are considered accrual recognition, revenue recognition. And then the last one, of course, payment would be you're based off the cash revenue recognition. An automated sales tracking system is not a contractual requirement. Uh, consider commercial and federal sales volumes uh, to determine how complex your sales system needs to be. And then one of the most important characteristics of your system, uh, sales reporting system, is to uh, you know, make sure you're isolating those GSA scheduled sales uh, from your other sales. So that could be federal, you know, commercial sales. Next, we're going to talk about, you know, in order to have a, a, uh, a successful sales tracking system, um, you need to understand you know, how to identify GSA sales. So, First thing you want to consider is, is the user eligible? And this can be determined by having an understanding of the users that are eligible to use the source of supply. Next is the product or service on your GSA contract. And then lastly is the contract number stated on your purchase order. And if you don't have a contract, uh, contract number stated on your purchase order, there's no contract reference or there's no evidence of another contracting vehicle. You can go and ask, are the terms and conditions the same as your GSA contract? Is the pricing at or below uh, your contract price? And another indication would be, is the sale made through GSA Advantage or eBuy? So if you don't have that number referenced on your PO, you know, those are a few more questions you need to ask. And at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, you, you can always ask, you know, your, your IOA, your PCO uh, or your uh, ACO uh, to help you if you have questions. So anyway. Okay, sales must be submitted 30 days after the end of each reporting period is the best practice to report your sales as quickly as possible. If no sales occur under your contract for the reporting period, you're still re responsible to report zero sales uh, for the reporting period. And this is something we see, you know, it, you know, oftentimes, you know, people think, well, I didn't have any sales to report. So um, just remember, you know, even if you have zero sales, you still need to log in to the FAS sales reporting system and report zero uh, sales, okay? And also keep in mind that you'll be asked to report your sales under each send separately. So incorporating that capability into your sales tracking system will make reporting easier once the reporting window opens. This is also, this also includes any special programs that you get incorporated in your MAS contract. So things like uh, cooperative purchase or disaster recovery, if that's incorporated in your contract, there's there's acronyms at the end of each uh, alphanumeric or numeric number in the sales reporting system that identifies those specific sins. So um, with that, um, please ensure that you report in US dollars rounded to the nearest whole dollar and uh, report all sales generated under your contract um, quarterly or monthly if you are incorporated, uh, if you have the uh, TDR incorporated in your contract, which is transactional data reporting. Yeah, here are some common problems related to the sales reporting, some issues that we see. Um, so blanket purchase agreements, if you have blanket, blanket purchase agreements that are awarded against your GSA contract, any orders, um, any orders that you have associated with those BPAs uh, must be reported to GSA. Um, and then remember open market items, they can be added to orders uh, placed against your GSA contract, however, they should not be reported. And then again, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to your assigned uh, contracting personnel. And let's talk a little bit about OLMs. We're getting a lot of questions on OLMs, so I'm just going to uh, just 
provide a quick summary of OLM. And if you have questions, there's a web link with some training and you can also contact your, your contracting personnel. So OLMs, what are OLMs? OLMs are supplies and or services acquired in direct support of an individual task or delivery or replaced against a scheduled contract or BPA. OLM pricing is not established at the scheduled contract or BPA level, but the order level at the order level. Um, so since OLMs are identified and acquired at the order level, the ordering contracting officer is responsible for making a fair and reasonable price determination. So that's the main thing to remember. Um, if, if you do, um, if you do, you know, end up using the OLM procedures, um, that order and agency contracting officer would be the one, uh, of course, it would be determined that fair and reasonable pricing. And then all scheduled terms and conditions apply to your GSA, you know, as your contract. So OLMs would be treated as, you know, if they were, you know, like a GSA contract item. So um, TAA would, you know, if it's an item, would it be TAA compliant, as well as any mandatory environmental attributes or clauses uh, would be applicable. The OLM amount cannot exceed 33.3% of the uh, order total. So with that, some of the best accounting practices are, you know, want to make sure that you have a, a system uh, as far as coding your OLMs as GSA items, right? And then establish a, 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 a capability to identify and track those orders as well as test the order limit, um, that 33.3%. And then also, you know, separating the OLMs and uh, identifying open market items. So understanding that those need to be identified and, and separated differently. And then and one other thing I wanted to add was um, OLMs, if you have a firm fixed price, you know, task order, the OLM needs to be time and material. So it has to be standalone. It can't be lumped into that uh, price of the order. So. And again, that kind of supports, you know, uh, testing that 33.33% rule. So after you reported your sales uh, for the reporting period, your industrial funding fee known as the IFF payment is actually calculated for you. So since the remittance of the IFF fee is due within 30 days following the end of the reporting period, just like your sales report, um, it is efficient to do both of them at the same time. And then uh, federal customers who use a schedule program, they pay this fee, which is included in your awarded contract price. So you simply uh, serve as the collection agent and remit the IFF payment at the end of the reporting period. This, this next uh, chart here, this is a, um, this is a snapshot of the pay.gov uh, uh, you know, for, for the payment methods. And uh, first it's the, uh, the automated clearinghouse, the AHC, uh, creditor, uh, debit card, the wallet, and PayPal. So those are the four payment methods that are accepted out on pay.gov uh, when, you're, when you're paying that IFF fee. And some methods have a daily amount allowed uh, for one or more or a combination of transactions. So all payments are routed through the Department of Treasury, a secure payment portal, again, at pay.gov. And let's talk about your, your GSA price list. So GSA price list, um, it, it will talk about um, how the pricing was determined fair and reasonable when your contract was awarded. So when your contract was awarded, you know, your pricing was negotiated. And at that point, it was agreed and, and, and determined that it was fair and reasonable. So um, it is your responsibility to provide an approved pricing to all ordering activities and comply with the terms and conditions in your price list. So. You also have a list of terms and conditions incorporated in your contract that can be found within the first few pages of your contract. And so we've listed a few items and conditions that you should know as these are the ones that directly affect your customer. So you will need to know what the maximum and minimum order threshold is. Um, so you determine whether you can accept an order or not. And also know your delivery terms. So for example, is the price included in your delivery terms or is it charged as a separate line item? The other thing to remember for delivery is how many days do you have to deliver the item you're selling? You can actually complete delivery within such a time frame. That's another question you should ask. And then prompt payment terms. If you negotiate these terms in your contract, you're required to provide this information on any invoice issued to GSA eligible users. And this is very important. Um, we see this a lot of times, uh, you know, not including the prompt payment terms on the invoice. It's to make that customer aware, right, that those terms are, are available and the, and the discount, right? So just keep in mind to remember to do that if you have uh, prompt payment terms to work your contract. And then lastly, geographic coverage. Does your pricing uh, change based off the location or there parts of the USA or other countries that you don't cover at all? And this next part is uh, just want to make sure that all quotes and orders and invoices 
um, that you demonstrate or you're charging the approved price or lower to GSA customers. So uh, here's a list of the most common problems that you should prepare to avoid. Uh, failing to recognize the customer is eligible to receive GSA pricing. New personnel not aware of GSA pricing or how to determine GSA pricing. The lack of effective controls with dealers and sales reps to ensure pricing is not applied. And the contractor starts charging a higher price, uh, GSA pricing and commercial prices increase. So if you have that commercial price increase, um, make sure you remember to submit a modification to, a, to um, a request your price increase as well. And then these are just some more common pitfalls related to delivery and order status, a failure to meet delivery time uh, frames requirements for limited and specific uh, contract items, uh, failure to provide order status updates on advantage. Next, we're going to talk about scope of contract. So scope of contract is, is uh, you are only allowed to sell products and services that fall within the scope of your uh, MAS, MAS contract. An agency now, like I said before, may add open market items into an order if necessary. However, as for you as a contractor, you just want to make sure that you're making them aware, you know, communicating this, you know, in, as being open market prior to the sale. So it's important to document it um, and provide that information uh, to the customer prior to the sale, you know, like in a written quote um, or an email, um, as well as if you include on the invoice. And that just ties it back to, when you're going to report sales, um, you would know that those uh, would not be uh, reportable. Of course, like I said before, open market items are not reportable. Um, and this will ensure the integrity of the schedules program is maintained and it can protect you and you know, from any unattended consequences, such as misrepresenting uh, non-contract items. So anyway, and then overall, we have a strong commitment to you and uh, our ordering, ordering activities that GSA contracting vehicles are used properly, hence the importance of maintaining scope adherence. And then there are a number of alternatives that are available to you so that you can remain competitive while still complying with the terms and conditions of your contract. One option is to submit a request to obtain additional categories or sins to add products and service to your existing contract or you could consider uh, looking into GSA contract team agreements. Um, that's where we would uh, partner with one or more GSA contract holders uh, to meet a, a agency's need for that order. And more information can be found um, out on the Vendor Support Center and uh, it's uh, regarding compliance and then scope of contract. So one of the best ways to determine what you're in scope of your contract is by going to the GSA library um, so if you have questions about your, you know, products that you're, you know, potentially thinking about requesting a modification for, you can go out and research and you can search your contract or you can look up the categories um, that are under your contract and see if the, if the products actually fit, um, fit the scope of those uh, categories. So, and furthermore, this page will allow you to see all the special item numbers under the category heading that are available to determine if the item is within the scope of contract. So if you're still unsure about the scope of contract, you should always utilize your procurement contracting officer for further assistance. Next, we're going to discuss TAA, commonly referred to as uh, Trade Agreement Act or TAA. TAA is applicable to all scheduled contracts and the clauses contained in your contract. If you offer products where you're required to fill out the tr trade agreement certificate as well, and designated countries, including those listed by TAA clause, um, it is important to point in uh, point out the list of countries is not static. So, you know, this list could get updated. So always make sure that you're going out and, and looking at the latest updates to the clause um, and, you know, can change uh, over time. So, and you can find this list of compliant countries in the Federal Acquisition Regulation Part 25, more specifically uh, in the definition section under subpart 25.003 on acquisition gov. A compliant TA product uh, is wholly growth um, or manufactured in the U.S. designated country or cons consists of materials from another country as long as it has been substantially transformed in the designated country into a new and different product uh, with the name characteristic and distinct use for materials um, is transformed. And the thing to remember is, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your guys' responsibility to just uh, demonstrate whether or not the items have been substantially transformed. 
And then having a system in place to monitor the country of origin is not a contractual requirement. However, compliance with the TAA is mandatory. So therefore, GSA highly recommends having some sort of system or process in place to track the origin of your products to protect yourself um, and the federal community. So um, it, is, it is also you know, a requirement to identify the correct country of origin and advantage. And I mean, that's something else we see a lot. Um, is uh, incorrect country of origin advantage. And if this changes, you know, when you, you know, when you're looking at your country of origin, of course, you know, you're gonna make sure that you update your contract accordingly. That includes advantage. And also notify your PCO if you identify that there's actually a non-compliant item. So it's coming from a not, you know, changes or it's coming from a non-compliant TA country. Um, so they can immediately uh, work with you to remove that from your price list and advantage. So your ability to demonstrate compliance to TA will be evaluated during the contractor assessment and be prepared to provide the country of origin. You know, we talked about that earlier, um, including any processes or procedures that you have in place to demonstrate TA compliance. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about basis of award. So basis award is, uh, is the customer discount relationship and it's established at the time of your award and is predicated off your GSA pricing. So when you establish your approved GSA pricing, this was, this was based on a specific customer or a group of customers that you provided uh, discounted pricing. You should always be aware of uh, what this relationship is and how it was established and have a, agreed to assure that this relationship is upheld. So the BOA pricing relationship is usually uh, explained on the standard form 1449, final proposal revision, or any SF30. And, and please remember, it's, it's important to have a system in place uh, to monitor this BOA discount relationship over the life of your contract. You know, you want to make sure that you, your customers are being charged the correct pricing at, at throughout the contract. And during the assessment, the IOA will verify <clears throat> your basis of award relationship and the price reduction clause. The IOA will also review the system uh, that you have in place to understand you have the ability, ability to maintain the discount relationship between the BOA customer and your GSA customers. And then please remember for the, the transactional data reporting or TDR contracts were not awarded based on the basis of award customer. However, pricing must be determined fair and reasonable in accordance with the FAR and GSAR uh, requirements. And then here's some common problems that we see with the basis of award is not knowing your basis of award customer discount relationship, a lack of an effective system or process for monitoring the basis of award discount relationship, and then uh, not maintaining the discount relationship identified in your contract. Next, we're going to talk about labor qualifications and some of the common pitfalls. So, it, it, you know, not assuring that the correct labor rates are charged for individuals working under those rates that meet the experience and education requirements, the min minimum qualifications in your contract. So, uh, for example, you know, you have your contract set up and you have specific labor descriptions uh, associated with, uh, with the, each uh, labor category. I um, just wanna make sure that you have the right experience uh, uh, that are working on those projects. Um, and something that we do test during the assessment is we'll sample uh, things like resumes, um, certificate, uh, certifications, or um, like a degree if required. <clears throat> and the next we're going to talk about GSA Advantage. So GSA Advantage is the online shopping and ordering system that provides buyers with access to uh, contractors and millions of products and services. Please note that being active on, uh, active participant in GSA Advantage, you're also allowed to participate in other programs as eBuy. So without an active uh, participation in Advantage, and your price list will not be able to have the numerous RFPs and RFQs available via eBuy. And then remember per the IFS 600, your electronic file must be received no than 30 days after the award. So meaning that you need to update your Advantage after you've you know, issued or been awarded a modification that you know, perhaps would have changed your pricing or terms and conditions that you make those changes in Advantage in 30 days. And your price list must be updated anytime. Like I said, in your deleting products, you know, exercising the, the EPA, increase, decrease pricing, anything that affects your MAS terms and conditions. And, and don't forget to identify any applicable indicators if you're providing green products. Also, it's important to remember um, to keep your responsibility uh, for your priceless information current on advantage to ensure accuracy um, in GSA's policy to remove any prices that's not had any updates over two years. So 
you start getting to that two-year mark and you have any ad cha changes, um, make sure you're going in there and up updating your GSA Advantage profile. So if your price list is removed, but you no longer are, are participating in Advantage, uh, without that, again, your price list will be unable to have access again to the RFQs and RFPs uh, in the buy. So we can't stress that enough. And when displaying items on GSA Advantage, ensure that you're taking advantage of uploading pictures and attributes such as environmental icons that apply to your products. And, and, and GSA Advantage, again, it's an online shop and ordering system that provides access to thousands of contractors and millions of products and services. And we've already talked about the requirement to upload the price list, but please note that your customers use Advantage to perform market research and compare contractors' offerings. And customers can also place orders using GSA Advantage. So all the orders are placed through Advantage site, they're primarily primary for products. GSA Advantage also uh, is a tool that, that you're, you can use to research your, your competition and fulfill orders placed by the uh, by your customers. And last uh, two more slides, this is large businesses. So if you're a large business, you're required to have a subcontracting plan and, and determined by the parameters set forth in your scheduled contract, you're required by law to establish goals for awarding subcontracts to qualified small businesses. So as a large business, you have the responsibility to submit a subcontracting plan to GSA. This is done by uh, through electronically through the electronic subcontracting reporting system. And the acronym is called uh, ESRS. And you also, you also need to check the system to see what kind of report you need to submit based off the type of subcontracting plan you have. This will, this will also determine when the report is due to GSA and check out ESRS website for more information. And please remember that the subcontracting goals are not a requirement for small businesses. And this, this is uh, the, the, really the kind of the last part of our assessment on our topics as they flow when you get your contractor assessment report. We're also reviewing contract administration. So it's important that you're keeping your information update current in your contract via like a modification if requested or required. And then uh, make sure that the, you know, your records location and that you're uh, accepting all your mass modifications and your, your status of your SAM is current as well as um, if you have any issues with bankruptcy or pending or recently completed novation agreements. Um, just have this information available. We will be going through this information and uh, talking about keeping your contract current. I'm gonna turn it over to Holly Caputo and she'll be discussing uh, the next few slides. Mm. Thank you, Frank. So uh, Frank's presentation really on contract requirements covered much of what you need to know for keeping your contract current. I'm going to add some specifics here on these last few slides on how to accomplish some of the tasks that we're requiring of you. Um, so there are two parties involved in a contract, as you already know, it's GSA and the contractor in this case. Any changes to the contract need to be documented in the contract file. The way we accomplish this, of course, is through contract modifications. Sometimes we refer to them as mods. So if I say mod from here on out, we're talking about a contract modification, which is any change that would be made to your MAS contract. A mod can be bilateral, it can be unilateral. And we have some examples here on the slide of both. Mods also fall into two categories. Those that are initiated by you, the contractor, and those that are initiated by us at GSA. There are different types of modifications also known as mod types. And then of course, within each mod type, you have mod subtypes. Those are chosen when you get into the eMod system to initiate your mod, which we'll cover in this presentation as well. Your GSA contract will prove to be more valuable to you if you keep your contract up to date and you do this with the help of these modifications. You should work with your contracting officer, your PCO to maintain the health of your contract by deleting obsolete items or labor categories and adding new ones as needed. Make sure that your customers and GSA know that what your legal name is and most importantly, be updating your authorized negotiators or other points of contact information so that we're able to reach you. All these things can be updated with modifications. While many of the modifications are bilateral, 
some such as options, extensions, uh, and cancellations would be another one that are unilateral, meaning we don't require a signature from the contractor. <laughs> Mass modifications are another type that should be mentioned briefly, briefly here. Um, those are the modifications that we initiate here on the GSA side. And they occur when we have uniform changes throughout the schedule. So in other words, a, a, a great example would be when the schedule is refreshed with terms and conditions and we're able to just put out a mass modification so that we can, we can cover that all at once. So let's take a look here at how you actually submit a modification request. When you as the contractor want to initiate a mod, you would log into the eMod system. I think this slide, yes, has the uh, web address there. And, and that should be a link when you, when you receive these slides. It's a web, eMod is a web-based application that allows you, the contractor, to electronically prepare and submit your contract modification to us here at GSA. Currently, all the contract modifications would be requested through this eMod website. On the eOffer eMod website, I didn't put all of the links here, um, but you'll see it on the eOffer eMod website. You can access multiple guides, frequently asked questions, and I believe there is still some training on there for how to complete eMods. This slide does have a direct link on the fourth bullet point down that I really want to point out to you. It's our new mass modification guide, you can, through this link, download the mass modification guide as a PDF. And I would encourage you to do that because then it's searchable by topic and it walks you through every mod type that you would need. It gives you the general information that you would need to start a mod. And of course, then you should contact your CEO um, for any other specifics that might be related to the to the mod when you're ready to submit it. Then of course, after you submit a modification and it's been signed, we will ask you to follow up with a SIP file and the instructions are available on the last link on this slide as well for using the schedules input program or SIP. Uh, so within the modification pro process, this uh, flow chart is really meant to um, show you that there are, are some more complex mods and some less complex mods. Some less complex mods include deletion or price reduction, authorized negotiator mods. And then there could be more complex modifications such as additions or uh, economic price adjustments, EPAs. If you're unsure about the complexity of the mod after consulting the mass mod guide that I pointed out on the last slide, contact your contract uh, specialist or your CO and they can help you with the requirements before you submit the mod. It's often helpful to do that if you're unsure rather than to have rejected mods and ha have to start over. Then I mentioned before, we do ask you with most mod types, you're gonna need to follow up with the schedules input program so that you can update your text file, terms and conditions and catalog file on GSA Advantage, uh, this slide covers how that's done. And again, there's a link for when you receive the slides. And lastly, if I could leave you with, with some parting words or, or some, some advice as far as my experience that I've had as, as a contracting officer, some pain points that I've experienced with contractors and, and maybe how to avoid them are when you're not proactive with keeping your contract current, especially with the annual assessment, that can lead to, not only can it lead to cancellation or not being able to exercise an option on time, it really puts, puts you in a crunch when you really need to make a change quickly, but now you have to uh, do all of these uh, other modifications to, to come back into compliance before you can you, you can update what you really needed to. So 
when you get that assessment from your IOA, if you look over it and see that there are concerns to be addressed, it's best to address those right away and, and not wait until you need some other modification to your contract. And then the other pain point that I see is not updating your authorized negotiators um, or your points of contact or having someone in that position who is familiar with your GSA contract has, has taken the training on the vendor support center and knows what's in your terms and conditions. Um, so I would just please ask you that you have a point of contact who can best be of service to you and your company to manage your GSA contract. 